Well, we have finally made it to the final Dresden Files book for right now. Because 12 months, I believe, is coming out in later this year. Oh my god, there's hair on my mic. Get out. What a great start to a video. Hi, welcome to YouTube. This is my channel. It's terrible, isn't it? So the final Dresden Files book as it stands right now, Battleground, this bad boy right here, uh, is awesome <laughs> in just about every way. So again, this is my second time reading it. I reread it to review it because for whatever reason, I went months without reviewing it. After I finished it, maybe I was emotionally scarred from what happened to this book. By the way, this will be full spoilers. It's book 17 of a series. You should expect that by now. Also says it in the title. Spoilers ahead. Um, I'm looking forward to what the hell Jim Butcher is going to do to top this because this was wild. I mean, this is every bit of a grand epic scale of a book, especially for the Dresden Files. And it really makes me want to restart the series because of how large and crazy this has gotten. Like they're still in Chicago, but you feel that after this, they might not be like the, the series has potential to expand well beyond Chicago because of what's going on. And after Peace Talks was kind of like the calm before the storm, here we are at Battleground where the stakes have never been higher. The power level of everybody is insane. Uh, of course, we lose characters in this book. And it's just, it's great. And it was actually more emotional and character depth uh, heavy and impactful than I expected, honestly, when I first read it or even remember from my first read because... Like, upon a reread, I really, t like, soaked in the dialogue, and there's just, there's a ton to talk about. We're going to get to it here in a second. I just, I, I, I'm just gushing over this book because it's fantastic. I think this, it's just, it's incredible. So, let's get into it. Again, I'm going to do what I normally do, go through, you know, my favorite parts, kind of going across, you know, from start to finish of the book. Not going to hit every single point, so I will miss things. Yell at me in the comments. Let's go. So when we start this book, uh, this is honestly the most like somber and sort of sober that I think Harry's been at the beginning of the Dresden Files book because of what happened in Peace Talks and knowing that F knew and the, uh, I was about to say the Forsaken, the outsiders are coming to destroy Chicago and kill everybody in their path and then potentially move on beyond Chicago and take over the world. Harry is, and, and honest, obviously this comes a lot through James Marster's reading of the book, He's just super down and depressed in a way that I've never heard him or read him as before. I mean, there's been some grim moments. I mean, you have changes. You have ghost story. There's been some super low moments for Harry Dresden. But this is honestly one of the, 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 the most notable times to me that I've just been like, damn. Like, Harry is really torn up right now and doesn't seem very confident at all that he can stop this. I mean, Ethnu being a literal titan swatting Mab like a fly in peace talks, like Thomas being up for execution and having to be exiled on Demon Reach. Like there's just so much going on. Like he has to worry about Maggie. He's worried about the Carpenters. Just everybody around him that he loves is at stake. And he knows that. And he just, he has to do whatever he can to save the city of Chicago. And it's, we'll get to it. But of course we start with a freaking Kraken battle on their way back to Chicago on the Water Beetle, coming from Demon Reach. You have Lara jumping around like a badass vampire ninja, like cutting at the Kraken, stabbing it. You've got Harry shoving a flare into a freaking hole in it. Uh, just tons of damage to the Water Beetle and the characters that are involved. When everything looks kind of grim, I mean, you've got Lara being a badass, but you know, Mab and Molly show up with like 12 foot long great white sharks or whatever they rode in on and just tear this crack into pieces. Mab just, I think it's Mab, right? No, Freitas shoves a grenade in the hole that Harry had shoved a flare into and just like detonates this Kraken. So right off the bat, we have this badass shark B Kraken plus fairies and vampires fight also with wizards and normal people. I mean, Murphy's there. And it's just a crazy, awesome, cool moment. Because when you, <laughs> you have them on the water beetle and you see like the suckers start coming up, and I'm just sitting there like, is there a goddamn Kraken about to happen? And sure enough, Harry's like, there's a Kraken. And we get Lara's great, you know, no tentacle porn jokes to Harry. So, I mean, it's just, it's right off the bat, 
awesome action, great humor, great wit. I love it. Jim Butcher is the man. This is also one of the first soul gazes in this book. When Harry soul gazes a damn kraken, like that's gonna mess you up. Uh, he also later on when he's like once they defeat the kraken and they're on land and he's galvanizing the troops, you know, trying to get Chicago ready for what's about to happen and really tell these people like run, hide, or fight. You're probably gonna die. You have to make your choice and stick to it, knowing what's coming. And he, uh, of course, is you know after his big speech and he's getting people you know designated spots like all right let's get the defenses going you have these dipshit police officers rudolph and who's the other asshole bradley uh that try to arrest him and be like come on down like it'll just take a few hours here he's like i literally don't have time like chicago's gonna explode and i need to be here and they're just like shut up dresden <laughs> rudolph is so unlikable already and james marsters makes him this whiny little bitch this nasally little asshole and I love it because it's so fitting for what a piece of garbage this character is. And we'll get to why he's the worst thing ever. But he's just this nasally little twit. Right off the bat, we get this foreshadowing when he holds a gun at Murphy in Dresden. No trigger discipline whatsoever. We sadly see that come to fruition later on. But Harry soul is Bradley. And Bradley's like, oh shit, okay. I understand what's happening now. Like, Rudolph, we're going to go. They have places to be. So then, of course, we lead into what is like our next combat. We have Black Court Vampires, Mavra. We've got Toot and his army going back and forth. They straight up just like fuck Mavra up. It's great. Uh, so, of course, we get Toot and his wonderful, my, you know, my lord, voice from James Marsters. And I, I love Toot and his army. They're so adorable. And Toot's little like girlfriend, not girlfriend, <laughs> is just hilarious. So we already like action set piece after action set piece and then sort of somber moments in between already fantastic we get enemies you haven't even seen before we get octo kongs vikings you know jotun these tall badass mfers that murphy takes out with a bazooka ayo let's go um you just you have you know their harry and their forces i mean you've got werewolves you got vampires you've got wizards you've got you also have the knights of the cross of course and you get this great moment with harry where i mean he's you know he's got the winter mantle he is the winter knight but he he hears these like children that are being attacked and he just like channels to winter like converge on the enemy make sure nothing harms these children so i mean just through what what could normally corrupt a character and make them a total villain almost and almost does at one point in this book there's so much of Harry still there and he always fights against it. And that's what I love about his character. And he does that with Molly too, where Molly sort of leans a little bit harder into the winter fairy princess uh, moniker. And Harry's always like, yeah, but you're still Molly Carpenter. Like you need to remember that and be that person too. Don't just be the winter lady. So it's awesome to get these good characters in these positions of crazy power and potential evil and having to balance that. It's fantastic to what has been uh, a controversial scene upcoming where Harry's 1v1 against the Jotun and just boasting about his, you know, capabilities and his triumphs just so the Jotun, like, respects him. It's a, just a great Vikings kind of moment. And then we get Murphy blowing the Jotun a nice little hole in his face with a bazooka. And she's just like, yeah, this is what I brought. <laughs> I'm useful. And then, of course... Like, through all this foreshadowing and knowing that Harry and Murphy love each other and that they've been having sex and they have this great relationship amongst all this chaos, dipshit asshole motherfucker Rudolph shows up. Once again, zero trigger discipline. Uh, somehow completely idiotic in his rambling saying that they just killed somebody when it's a literal goddamn giant. Like, look around you, bro. Situational awareness. Look at what's happening. This isn't normal circumstances. And of course he shoots and kills Murphy. And just the way that it happens in the book, just the, the fact that they're trying to disarm him, like they're trying to talk him down and he just panics and shoots her. Now, like when I first read this, um, when I got to that moment in the book, I was incredibly pissed off. I was ready to punch a wall as far as just like, I felt Murphy got robbed of a good death in that moment. I, I've sort of come around, you know, it being months in between my first read and rereading that moment now. 
simply because I, I think it, it is handled well. I just disagreed with what happened because I wanted her to get a better death, if that makes any sense. Like, my per I, at the time, I preferred that, like, she would have died fighting the Jotun or something like that. Like, trying to save Harry and dying in the process as opposed to just this regular asshole cop in a place that he shouldn't be and just shooting and killing her accidentally. I felt like it was awful, but I guess it's it's also good because once she's human, she has no real business fighting with literal gods around her and vampires and werewolves and all this crazy shit that's happening. And it just kind of shows that anything can happen to any anybody at any moment. I mean, especially a human character, like she can just die. And I get it. I still don't love it. Uh, but but I've come around to it. it. It certainly did not make me hate the book. I love this book. I think it's the best Dresden book that I've read. It absolutely did not make me go back and hate the rest of the series like you psychopaths. They go back and one star every Dresden book because fucking Murphy got shot. What are you crazy? That doesn't take away from what happened in this entire series. Uh, so there's my little rant there. But it just it still hit hard even when you know it's coming and you see the foreshadowing. You know this moment's going to happen. My biggest gripe with it is Harry didn't just get to completely obliterate Rudolph. Like, I wanted to see him do a Jason X on him, just freeze his face and, like, smash it into the ground or something. Like, I wanted him to just obliterate him. And I get it. You don't really want that for Harry as a character because he would probably be too lost at that point. And, I mean, he damn near gets there. It looks like Butter's in his way with Sonya in his way. I mean, he basically fucks both of them up. And then finally gets to the point where Butters calms him down and then he just breaks and he's just like, he took her from me. Like, this isn't fair. And you just get this crazy, impactful, emotional moment where Harry just lost the love of his life again, because before it was Susan and we saw how that ended. Now you lose Murphy to this dipshit that just accidentally shoots her. And then you still have to go defend and save Chicago from a Titan in the film war. Uh, and it's just like, how powerless must you feel in that moment? You have such great power and you couldn't save this woman that you love. Like it's so well done and emotional. And as much as I hated it at the time, and I just wish he had like a more warrior's death. We get that moment with guard later where Harry basically is us saying like, it's not fair. Like it wasn't a clean death or whatever. Like she deserved and guards just like, how dare you? Like she just killed a fucking Joe ton. Don't you dare take that away from her because of how she fell in combat. Like, don't discredit anything she did because of, and it's just, that moment is fantastic. And it's, I keep saying fantastic because this book is fantastic. And then, of course, after this, we get Murphy's body carried away. They're going to, you know, send her off to Valhalla. And Mab immediately is just like, Harry, by the way, if I fall tonight, you're, you're going to have to go kill Molly. Because I don't think she's ready to be the Queen of Winter. So if you could just make sure that she dies, like, cool. And Harry's like, oh, you're serious, aren't you? Uh, yeah, you're not going to die because I'm not going to kill Molly. So let's just move next next subject, okay? We get this fantastic moment of Harry talking to Grimalkin about how outnumbered and kind of screwed they are, but they basically bait Corb and the Felmore into open combat where they shouldn't be and slaughter tons of them. So he's losing numbers and getting pissed off because he's like, how are we losing to humans? Like, this shouldn't be happening. We get this great scene of, like, hundreds of she charging into the Fomor and just taking tons of them out. Like, a, this is, like, Dresden's version of, like, the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Just, like, charging into a completely, like, insurmountable odds, just way outnumbered and coming out victorious. It's a fantastic moment. And then, of course, we get, you know, Mab, Harry, uh, was it Odin? I think they kept calling him one eye. I don't remember. <laughs> Apparently, uh, you get Mab's horse just like going against Ethnu, kind of getting the shit kicked out of them. But Mab distracts Ethnu long enough to basically get the eye away from her. So as this fight's going on, Mab basically baits Ethnu into using the eye on her and like just deletes her. You think Mab's gone? It's like oh shit. <laughs> and of course, as that happens, and like the Fomor get caught in the open field. Mab actually calls to Molly and she shows up like 12 foot tall trolls and just a badass winter lady army. So, I mean, just they're just throwing everything at this chick, Ethnu, and just like greatest, biggest epic scale Dresden fight that we've had to this point. 
and it's just everything is like a geek's fantasy. It's so, so awesome. We then get the wild hunt riding in. Oh, meanwhile, like Welcome to the Jungle is playing in the background and, and Molly's entrance and while this fight's going on. It's a, it's a brilliant, awesome moment that I'm sure every fan of Dresden loves. So while this is happening, you know, Harry ends up getting like shot. And then he's, as he's kind of like being crippled and dying, he summons Titania, who <laughs> electrocutes the shit out of him. And it's funny because it like cauterizes the gunshot wound, so he's fine. And then Titania goes at it with F, New, and Mab. And she's just like, of course, like, why would I let this happen? Of course, I'm here to defeat you. Like, Ethnu, you're not just going to fight Mab and take out the Winter Queen while we also have the Summer Queen. Ethnu charges up the eye again and shoots it straight at Titania, who, like, fucking air bends it and chucks it into the sky. And everything from winter just turns to rain and starts pouring down. So, of course, you've got, you know, Dark Knight, rainy battle, very fitting for this apocalyptic war that's going on. And then Ethnu just kind of takes everybody out. And she's left with Harry, and she just starts talking shit, and she's just like, who are you, this little puny person to think that you can stand against a god? And he can't come up with anything, so he's just like, yeah, well, you suck. <laughs> then we get, of course, another badass moment from Butters, right after he was a human Cuisinart, just sawing up Fomor, steps in between Ethnu and Harry, just because that's who he has to be as a Knight of a Cross, and he is just like the perfect embodiment of that sword. And then, of course, we get Ebenezer joining the fight. I mean, everybody is here for this battle. We then get the Archive. Yeah, remember her? She's a badass. I'm not for herself. So we get the Archive throwing her on her power. We get Marcone showing up with Guard and Hendrix. And Sonya rejoins the fight. But he kind of loses his sword after he cuts Ethnu. So, like, you can see that she can bleed. She's clearly getting worn down. But she, like, chucks the sword into some fire. And I, I guess I've been told that you can't actually destroy the sword that way. So they, may, they might just have to like dig it out of the rubble or reforge it if it's messed up. I don't know how the swords work. I'm sorry. We, of course, then have this great moment where Ethnu is kind of distracted and Lara just like freaking ninja stealth, like kicks the shit out of Ethnu and the eye goes flying. Marcone picks it up and he's stalling to give Harry time. And <laughs> Marcone just starts talking shit. And you're just like, well, like Marcone's human, right? Like, he didn't pick up the coin before, as far as we know. He's talking shit to Ethnu, and she's just like, who are these garbage humans talking to me this way? This isn't cool. And he's like, be a good girl and go get the eye, and, like, chucks it into Lake Michigan. <laughs> it's just like, damn, dude has some balls. And then, of course, Ethnu is just, like, peasant, and, like, just breaks his neck, and Harry's just like, oh, my God, Marcone's dead, and, like, rushes over to him, and Marcone is just like, ugh. <sighs> Oh, good, it worked. And Harry's like, what the fuck? He's just like, yeah, of course. Like, you think I didn't pick up the coin, you dipshit? It starts growing horns. We're just like, all right, so now we have badass, fallen, Denarian, like, whatever, however many titles he has now, Marcone. Who's going to be an ultimate uh, antagonist upcoming? Because damn, now we've got, like, superpowered Marcone. So then, of course, Harry, Marcone, and Bob are working to bind Ethnu, and when Harry brings Bob into it, he's just like, what the fuck? No, get me out of here! Uh, which, Bob's always hilarious. So, of course, they're working on binding her, and as they're doing it, uh, Ethnu just, like, shows, like, projects, like, an image almost to Harry of, like, the Carpenter house and how all the Fomor or, like, the human troops had gone in, like, gunned down Michael and killed everybody, Maggie, like, everybody's dead. And Harry, I guess, like, starts to kind of believe it. And he's like, oh, my God, like, I can't save anybody. Everybody's dead. And he's just like, hey, I forgot the dog. She's just like, what? He's like, yeah, the dog, Mouse. He's like, he's always with her. He's like, none of that shit happened. That's not real. And she just freaks out. She's just like, <laughs> she's like, someone betrayed me. And then, of course, we get... Harry finally calling Alfred, Demon Reach to come sweep her up and you just get this giant like Demon Reach tidal wave to come wash Ethnu away and go bind her ass on Demon Reach, which is terrifying in itself. And then of course we have like the aftermath of that once they finally have kind of like defeated everybody, Ethnu's bound on Demon Reach and you have this Marcone versus Harry moment where Marcone is just like, you know, I could definitely kill you right now, but I feel like that's gonna happen later. And Harry's like, yeah, like at some point we're gonna have to fight. And then Marcone's like, well, I guess lucky for you, you took down the Titan. Like, here's the eye, and, like, vanishes. So, of course, Harry's left with the eye. 
It looks like he just killed Ethnu and got rid of her. Power play by Marcone. He knows what he's up to. And we'll see at a later date when they're going to have to fight. We finally get, you know, falling action. We get Harry taking Justine finally to go see Thomas on Demon Reach. Only to learn that he's like, oh, shit. Thomas was saying Justine. She's possessed by he who walks beside. And that's not good. So we do get that moment of kind of her being left there to be caught up by Demon Reach 2. So like everybody's in jail. Harry gets out basically almost killing, like dying in the process kind of, but he's fine. And then of course we get the moment that I talked about where Harry's talking to Guard about Murphy's sacrifice. Fantastic moment there. We get Ramirez's punk ass coming back to talk to Harry about how the, the White Council has tossed him out. He's kind of like a rogue wizard. And Harry's like, this is bullshit. Like I saved everybody. So now like the White Council is against him. And we when he's telling Michael about this, Michael just goes on a tirade, just swearing, cussing like a sailor. It's hilarious because Harry's just like, Michael's cussing right now. What is happening? Because he just thought it was total bullshit that they cast him out. It's great. We then, of course, get what 12 months is going to be about, where uh, Lara and Mab basically decide that Harry and Lara are going to get married in a year, uh, which is kind of Harry's like, can we at least wait? What the hell is this? Because they want to sort of join the Fae and the Red Court to be kind of like a power couple thing. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that relationship. Maybe Harry will have more kids. Molly finally does return home to tell the Carpenter family that she is indeed the Winter Lady. And Michael and her mom are just like, duh. <laughs> but you think we're stupid? Like, we know that. But thanks for finally telling us. Uh, that doesn't get you out of doing dishes and shit, though, because you're still our daughter. So it's just a great wholesome moment to sort of end on, which of course leads us into Christmas Eve, which is just the most adorable, wholesome Dresden tale in the land. Uh, Maggie gets to meet Santa Claus. It's just a wonderful, nice moment to have after the sort of exhausting battle that was Battleground and losing Murphy. Christmas Eve kind of makes up for it and doesn't make it hurt so bad. So that is Battleground. It is epic in every sense of the word. It's Yes, there's a lot of action. It's the most action-y Dresden book that exists, but there's so much great dialogue. There's so many great impactful emotional moments that you honestly don't expect from something that's this action heavy. And it's just balanced so well. I love this book. It is great. I will likely read the series again from start to finish because I want to see how this quaint little like urban fantasy noir novel turned into what it is now. And what it's going to become beyond, because we're still five books away from the conclusion of this arc and then the three epic trilogy books. I mean, we're going to be reading Dresden for a long time. I can't wait. It's excellent. Uh, I love this book. Read it if you haven't. If you're watching this, I just spoiled the shit out of the book, so hopefully you've read it. And man, the wait to 12 months is going to be tough. And when we finally get there, I'm sure it's going to be a doozy. So until next time, guys, keep reading.